Strike up the band. Cue the music. Lights, camera, action. We're talking about the Bard in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Greetings musicians, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Today we're taking an in-depth look at the Bard class in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. We're going to cover everything you need to know to create a Bard in your next D&D campaign. We're going to cover the different class features including the Bard at Colleges, Ability Scores, Spells, and other feats and build options that you need to know to help prepare your Bard to change the world with the power of music. We're also going to get you inspired by looking at famous Bards from fantasy fiction, um, music and theatre, books, literature, and various other sources, as well as role-playing options uh, to really help you bring out the artistic flair of your bard. With that, let's rock and roll. So why play a bard? Well, the bard is the ultimate jack of all trades, but they are also the unquestioned masters of poetry and song. Yeah, they use the magic of music to confound their enemies or boost their allies and really help out around the battlefield. The bard is the ultimate creative class. Few can match the bard's uncanny knack to be able to be good at almost anything. Yeah. And they've got plenty of charisma and social skill to boot. And that charisma just makes it so fun to play such a larger than life personality, which is, I think, the main key of role playing the bard and just being a bard in general. It is an immensely fun and satisfying class to play because you really feel like there's anything at your fingertips. If you want to engage in the social exploration or combat, uh, components of the game, the bard has options for you. The bard just might be the most interesting, unique, and potent class in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Few classes can match the bard's ability to excel at almost any task while also getting to roleplay such a satisfying character at the same time. I find that no matter what situation you're in at the table, the bard always has a trick up their sleeve. Yeah, although this is a trait of the very experienced bards. Because a lot of new players have a lot of trouble grasping the subtle uh, power of the bard's abilities. Things like illusions, social situations, and the bard's very subtle brand of magic often mean that it takes a little bit of skill and experience before you really realize the power of the bard. Whereas new players tend to brush the bard off as being like, well, there's no offensive magic here. What am I supposed to do with this class? But that putting the bard in the hands of an experienced player can be a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, but an experienced player playing a bard can basically confound even the most devious plans of an insidious DM. In the immortal words of the bard, William Shakespeare, music oft have such a charm to make bad good and good provoke to harm. Your bard might be a wandering minstrel, a warrior poet, an acrobatic thief and performer. They could be an archaeologist, an investigator, a storyteller, or more. No matter the way, all bards know that the pen is mightier than the sword, and they know the true power of the spoken word. So what about the bard's role in the party? The bard is another class that can play any role you wish. They truly know that all the world's a stage, and all men and women merely players. When we look at um, combat situations, uh, the bard has a number of spells to choose from and you can choose whether you want to go the route of being like, hey, I'm going to take these combat spells as well as they can use ranged weapons or finesse weapons. Yeah, you can be a melee fighter, a control-based spellcaster, a damage-dealing spellcaster, an archer. You really have to choose what your area of specialization is going to be but you're always gonna have this diversity to your options as well. And in exploration, that carries through just as well because the bards have so many great skill boosting abilities, whether it's in their spells or the fact that they gain proficiency in so many skills that there's nothing you really can't do. Um, at the same time, because they are primary spell casters, they have the ability to select the really key spells that are going to help the party overcome specific situations. Yeah, and if we're talking about the social aspect of the game, uh, not only is 
the bard's charisma going to really be prominent here but combine that with spell casting with things like being able to like mind control people or charm people or things of that nature um you can really take the hold of most social mm -hmm. situations in the game and there's rarely a time that a bard isn't the face of the party the bard's ability to manipulate social situations and get away with it makes them so much fun and it really helps if you are someone that needs to come out of your shell role-playing play the bard it really gets you into character really gets you thinking about all the great potentiality that you can get from role-playing um that larger than life personality is so easy to latch onto that you can have with a bard and if you're an experienced role player the only thing you have to be careful of is taking over the spotlight and not letting anyone else get a word in edgewise so let's get inspired for our bard draw on that bardic inspiration ourselves yeah yeah so the bard is fantastic because you can really draw inspiration from your favorite musician when playing your character um, I immediately think of David Bowie as the Goblin King in Labyrinth. He is like the bard to me. But like, I would even say any any musical uh, professional that stands out. Uh, like, I even immediately, Freddie Mercury jumps to my head. Or Beyonce. Or Beyonce. Yeah, there's so many great musicians that had been engaged with the world through their art that almost seem like in what they do and the way that they live their life, they are an adventurer. Um, and so whether you have a favorite band, musician, artist, it's a great thing to latch onto um, because built in, you've already got some lyrics for some songs that you can uh, pull out in the middle of the game. Yeah, there's uh, other really great examples of bards like the bard himself, William Shakespeare. Yes, William Shakespeare basically has a line about any topic <laughs> That you can possibly imagine. Looking through William Shakespeare's sonnets and plays is pretty much going to find a great bit of dialogue that you can pull out as a quip. The thing that is awesome for this is if you've ever looked up any of those Shakespearean insult generators, yeah. it's perfect I, for I getting some is. really creative cutting words in. The Bard is directly inspired by the storytellers and scalds of ancient Gaelic cultures. There's a very famous bard known as Tailson, uh, who is said to have been the father of Merlin. Okay. Yeah, music has been a part of human culture and society basically everywhere. Yeah. Um, and you can look back to the, the traditions of poetry that emerged in ancient Greece, um, the different traditions of poetry and music that emerged in China and Japan and India. Everybody has hymns and music and their own notations on what a bard entertainment and poetry were that can inspire your character in real world ways. It's actually quite difficult to find an exact example of bard from a lot of the popular movies, books, and mm -hmm. TV shows out there. Um, but when I turn to Lord of the Rings, I, I would argue that Pippin is, is a bard. As an adventurer, no, he doesn't cast spells or anything yeah. like that, but to me, he's a very musical character. He's a very performance-based character. His charisma is a little on the strange side because he yeah. is like, an, uh, he like causes accidents wherever he goes, but something about him is just so lovable and fun. And he does sing a lot of songs. And I find that Lord of the Rings in general is very rooted Music in... Music and storytelling are a huge part of the whole metaphor of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Because even the trilogy itself is conceived of as the book that Bilbo Baggins and Frodo Baggins then wrote about their journeys. Yeah. Cataloging our history through song is such a human thing. Um, and I think that that's such a point of inspiration for playing a bard, because what will be the song that you write about your campaign? A huge influence for me on D&D, &D, and I don't know why this is, are these 1980s animated cartoons like Rock and Rule, Heavy Metal, Gem and the Holograms, and Josie and the Pussycats. I love that. For some reason, this archetype emerged around the time that D&D &D was really coming of age of this band of musicians going on epic adventures. And I think that one of the most enduring images, that one campaign that everyone wants to run, is the campaign where everyone is playing as a bard and the villain is also a bard. 
Um, and if you've never seen it before, there's this wonderful film called Rock and Roll. It's an animated film. The style is a little bit Disney, um, but it's totally worth checking out because Omar, Angel, and Mock are such an awesome trilogy of bardic characters that get into a wonderful conflict that can inspire your character. So let's talk about building your bard. Yeah, the bard is actually a really difficult class to build and play in game. Yeah, you, you have a lot of choices to make and a lot of those choices actually uh, revolve around your spell selection and spell casting in general. So let's start off by looking at the core class features of the bard and then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how to make the most of your magic and song. Uh, looking at the bard, uh, starting off for hit points, we have a D8 hit die. For armor, bards get access to light armor. And for weapons, you get simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, and short swords. For skills and tools, you get to choose any three skills plus three musical instruments. And for saving throws, bards are proficient in dexterity and charisma saves. That's a pretty lightweight packet. Yeah, but the thing that really stands out to me is choosing any three skills you want. No limitations. And of course, the most important choice for your bard are what are your three musical instruments? This is an iconic choice. Yeah. Um, and I am a pretty big fan of having uh, magical electric guitars in my campaign settings. But of course, uh, good choices are always going to be things like the lute, the violin, uh, or what about a drummer bard? That's fun. Like the, like the, would it be like a traveling drum kit or do you have just like a drum that you're, you know, <laughs> yeah, something like, that. They, like the little over the shoulder drum and they're walking around doing the, t -t 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 -t. oh, that would be really cool. Actually. A little drummer boy. Yeah. 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 Let's look at the bard spell casting now. Bards are primary spell casters, starting with a handful of cantrips and first level spells and gaining more spell slots every time they gain a new level. Bard spellcasting is based on their Charisma score, which determines your spell save DC and spell attack bonus. Now, bards have a limited number of spells known, which are chosen from the bard spell list. A bard usually learns one new spell per level. When you gain a bard level, you can also choose one spell you know and replace it with another spell from the bard spell list of any level that you can cast. At higher levels as a bard, you're gonna get something really cool called Magical Secrets. And this occurs at 10th, 14th, and 18th level. Yeah, at these levels, you learn two spells, but they can be chosen from any class's spell list. Now, bear in mind that when you're choosing these spells, these count against the total number of spells known that are shown in the bard uh, spell list table. So they're not extra and on top of what's on the table, they're included in, in that. We're gonna be talking a lot more about what to choose with this ability, but we wanted to mention it now with the spell casting for the bard because it makes a big difference. So let's talk about the ability scores that you're gonna choose as a bard. I, I'm gonna start with the most obvious one as with all spell casters, uh, you wanna choose the ability score associated with your spell casting, which is charisma for the bard. It goes without saying that if you're playing a bard, you're probably here for the high charisma score. It powers your spells and spell casting, as Kelly said, and it also makes you just the ultimate social force at the table. I would say after that, I would look at dexterity since most bards are going to be using ranged or finesse weapons. Along with light armor. So you want to kick up your AC a little bit and give you that higher initiative score. Of course, uh, with any spellcaster, constitution is also an important one to look at just for all those concentration checks that you're probably going to be making. I suppose some bards might want to take strength. Yeah, if you are going to go for heavier weapons and armor with maybe like a College of Valor bard, you might want to focus on your strength instead. But I think there's a certain point where I'm like, why aren't you just playing a paladin? And then after that, we have wisdom and intelligence. You're going to have a high charisma, but there's nothing worse than hollow words. So you really want to have a good intelligence or wisdom score, I think to really round out the role playing potential for your character. I also think depending on what role in the party you're gonna fit into, because the, the bard can fit in so many different places. Yeah. If you are going to end up being the scout of your party, you may want a high wisdom score. But you might be the knowledgeable sage of your party. You might be the tactician and the planner, in which case you're gonna want that high intelligence score. I really think it depends both on how you wanna role play your character and the role that you wanna fulfill in the party. So if we're going to be playing a bard, what races do we want to look at? The half-elf is hands down the strongest mechanical option. 
for why, the card. Why is that? A plus two bonus to your charisma, two additional skills, dark vision, and a plus one bonus to two other ability scores of your choice, which are probably going to be dexterity and your constitution. This means that with a uh, bard that is uh, using point by, you can have a 16 dexterity, 16 charisma, and a 14 constitution, and you are pretty much golden from there. Tieflings are pretty good. Both kind of have become iconic as bards because they're both kind of on the fringes of uh, civilization in many sort of ways. And throughout history, actually, performers and bards in general have also kind of occupied that weird, like, alluring but social outcast sort of thing, which makes the half-elves and tieflings really gravitate towards the bard class. I, I would also say, like, the mental image that I get, and maybe it's just because of the pictures in the book, but I've always imagined the halfling bard, even though it's not as That's strong. because you like Pippin. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> the lightfoot halflings still get the charisma boost. The halfling luck thing will come up. Because you're going to make so many skill checks. Yeah. Um, and the dexterity boost is really, really great. Um, so, no, I think that they're actually a really excellent option. So if you want to look at some of the other uh, um, fantasy races that are found in Volo's Guide to Monsters, or Mordenkind's Tome of Foes now, which has the Eladrin, Dr Dark Elves, and Drow, cool options too. Yeah. Let's talk about one of the coolest abilities that the bards get, and that's their bardic inspiration. I love this power. Um, it's so useful, um, but it's tricky to use at the same time. As a bard, you gain the Bardic Inspiration ability, which allows you to, to inspire others with the power of your music and poetry. With Bardic Inspiration, you have a number of Bardic Inspiration dice, uh, which are d6s, which uh, the number is equal to your Charisma modifier. As a bonus action, you can give one of these Bardic Inspiration dice to yourself or another ally within 60 feet of you. And then any time in the next 10 minutes, that ally can spend that Bardic Inspiration die when they make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. You can make the roll, and then before the outcome is determined, you can choose to use the Bardic Inspiration dice to add to that roll. Yeah, I usually find the key times to use it are when you roll between like an 8 and an 11 on the dice, and you're not sure that's going to be enough yeah. with your modifiers. The key thing with Bardic Inspiration is that uh, your Bardic Inspiration dice um, recover on a long rest, but at 5th level, they recover on a short rest, which is actually like a gigantic upgrade, and it makes it really weird for the first couple levels how much you have to ration it, Yeah, and then all of a sudden, you just are handing it out like candy because it comes back on the short rest. I, I, I like to recommend that as a bard, you get a small stack of special colored dice to represent your bardic inspiration uh, so that you can actually pass them out uh, to your party members when you give out inspiration because so many times as a bard, you're going to have to remind your allies that you gave them bardic inspiration after they've low, uh, made a low roll. Um, so having that extra die there to remind them, hey, eh, eh. Oh, the amount of times that the bard at our table has had to be like, uh, Kelly, you, you rolled poorly and missed, but I gave you bardic inspiration this round. Yeah. What are you doing? I, I forgot so many times. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he doesn't give them to me. <laughs> Handing out bardic inspiration is a bonus action, but it's not a spell. So you can, in the same turn, hand out bardic inspiration and cast a spell. Pretty effective combination. Yeah. I might add, right? Especially if you know that that spell is then going to is going to build on the inspiration somehow. Another two really cool abilities that the bard has is expertise and jack of all trades, which work really well this together. This is why the bard is such an awesome skill monkey. Yeah, um, expertise you get to double your proficiency in two skills, and then two more as you gain higher levels, which I think are probably going to be persuasion and or deception. Yeah probably stealth and then maybe like acrobatics or performance possibly and then add on top of that jack of all trades which allows you to add half your proficiency bonus to all the skills that you're not already proficient in here's a key detail though jack of all trades affects every ability check you make that does not already factor in your proficiency bonus this means that it can have an effect on ability checks that you can never gain proficiency in anyways because did you know, rolling for initiative is an ability check. 
So, so you get to add. Yes, yeah, so you get to add half, half your, your proficiency, proficiency to your to your initiative as a bard. <laughs> You're good at everything. That's why it's called Jack of All Trades. Indeed. So let's talk about the bardic colleges that we can choose. You gain abilities at third, sixth, and fourteenth level, and uh, these can really uh, change change your bard. And there's a couple options presented in the player's handbook, and then a few other ones presented in Xanathar's. Yeah, in the player's handbook, the bards only get two: the College of of Lore and the College of Valor. But in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, we saw the College of Whispers, uh, the College of Swords, and the College of Glamour. Um, in general, each bardic college is pretty small in the way that it impacts the bard's overall package, but they all kind of drive the bard in different unique paths. I'm currently running a campaign right now with a College of Lore bard and another with a College of Valor bard, and it shocks me how different the playstyle is between the two, and that really is all in the difference between how they work with bardic inspiration. So let's start off by looking at the College of Lore. The College of Lore, uh, in reading them, is is always been my favorite, uh, but that's just because my favorite aspect of the Bard is how many skills they get. It might be the strongest of the Bardic Colleges. Right away at third level, uh, when you take the College of Lore, you gain proficiency in three more skills, which is crazy because at this point now, you uh, if you're a half-elf Bard, you're going to have proficiency in ten skills. It's ten out of eighteen. Yeah. The College of Lore is also awesome because it transforms your uh, bardic inspiration by giving you a new option called Cutting Words. This is where you gotta look up the Shakespearean insults because you now get a reaction when another creature makes an attack roll or an ability check. You can use your bardic inspiration to roll the die and give them a penalty to that roll. Yeah, so now you can use bardic inspiration not only to boost your friends, but to hinder your enemies. And I think that's so cool. And also, it's just so much fun to yell out curses at the, uh, the enemies on the table. Cutting words doesn't apply to saving throws. So you can't insult somebody so that they fail a saving throw against one of your spells. At level 6, they also get an additional set of magical secrets. So not only are you getting magical secrets four levels earlier than any other bard, but now this is two additional spells over top of your regular spells known. And getting that magical secrets coming online at level six is a real game changer for the... So let's talk about the College of Valor Bard. A little bit more combat oriented. Yeah, because you get proficiency in martial weapons, medium armor, and shields. And you get combat inspiration, which is pretty cool because it transforms your bardic inspiration by giving your allies a new way to use their bardic inspiration die that they get, right? Now your allies can spend their bardic inspiration to actually add to a damage roll, or they can use a reaction to add to their AC, much in the same way that the College of uh, Lore Bard can also use that to act as an attack roll penalty. It would be cool though to see a party with both types of bard and there's just dice going all <laughs> over the place for every roll that you can I think of. I think that that would make me cry as a DM. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. At level 6, the College of Valor Bard also gets extra attack, so they get to make two attacks uh, with the attack action. Like most fighting classes, that's going to be pretty key yeah. if you are going to be more combat oriented. Yep. And then at level 14, they gain the um, Battle Magic ability, which lets them make a bonus action attack after they cast a spell. And I actually think that with the College of Valor Bard, there's a really great recipe here for an awesome archer build that comes online pretty late in the game, but is really good nonetheless because you can use your 10th level magical secrets to pick up Swift Quiver and pick up Sharpshooter. And it's starting at level 10, you're going to be making four attacks per turn. Now, looking at the other subclasses in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, yeah. uh, the direct comparison here is the College of Swords is kind of a, a more melee-focused take on the College of Valor Bard. Yeah, the Valor kind of steers itself well towards the Archer, whereas the Swords is all about that melee combat. Mm -hmm. It really is, because the Blade Flourishes um, do similar things as the um, Combat Inspiration, but they only apply for you. So if you want to have all that glory in melee combat as a Bard, College of Swords is the way to go. What about the College of Whispers? I actually pretty... I, I like this one. This one's really cool because you can use your Bardic Inspiration to create like a psychic sneak attack. Yeah. 
It's, it's pretty neat and it has some really fantastic abilities for impersonation as well. It kind of makes the bard a little bit closer to a rogue. And then we have the College of Glamour. The College of Glamour's uh, bardic inspiration ability is really good. Yeah. Um, because their ability that they get at level three lets them spend one bardic inspiration uh, die to give a number of allies equal to their charisma modifier temporary hit points and then all those allies can use their reaction to move their speed without provoking opportunity attacks doesn't it also they have an ability is it the same ability that makes them look like yeah that looks beautiful? looks super beautiful and glamorous like this is the david bowie I, uh yeah i picture yeah the goblin king yeah. david bowie is the glamour bard especially because then they get the ability that lets them cast command as a bonus action so they get to be really really bossy i think there's some great role-playing opportunities with the college of glamour um, I think it's really unique and interesting as like, kind of like the domineering leader. I want to, I want to hear about somebody that played David Bowie, Goblin King, Glamour Bard. Yeah. So let's talk about some of our favorite spells that we can cast as the Bard. Starting off with cantrips, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to take Vicious Mockery. Vicious Mockery is such a fun spell and so appropriate for the Bard. It's, it just adds to that... Um, like power of word when it lands the killing blow <laughs> it's like you insulted someone to death I, I, I think it's so funny at our table how sometimes the vicious mockery is actually such mundane like uh, Joe will just be like haha you smell and then the creature dies and it's just like <laughs> wow Yeah, bards get fewer cantrips than everyone else uh, but the ones that they do get, like Vicious Mockery, Mage Hand, and Minor Illusion, give you a great packet of abilities. And uh, what about our damage dealing spells? So Bards actually have some really interesting options for this. Uh, right off the bat, you've got Thunder Wave and Shatter. Uh, I like to think of them as your face-melting solo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, The you, you're riffing on the guitar so hard that, that everything, all the glass shatters in the yeah, room and everything. Yeah. It's, it's perfect. Um, Dissonant Whispers is also really fantastic because... You can cast it on a target, deal some psychic damage, and then because it forces them to move, your allies can make opportunity attacks against them when they move away. At higher levels, um, bards get synaptic static, which was printed in uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which is basically the psychic fireball. Yeah. Yeah, bards also get animate objects. It's one of those spells that you don't think is going to be as cool as it is. But it always is. Until yeah. uh, a pile of gold comes to life and pelts your villain to death. Yep. So what about our battlefield control spells? Uh, there's some really... Oh, it gets such good spells here. You yeah. get sleep, you've got hold person, um, and eventually hold monster. And what about Tasha's hideous laughter? <sighs> I've been undone by that spell so many times. It's, it's another one that like, bards, I, I just find their spells so fun to use, so fun to role play, so fun to see on the battlefield. Uh, taking a creature out of the combat by having them rolling on the floor laughing is is just so great. The other one that's really worth mentioning, of course, is Hypnotic Pattern, which is an encounter-ending spell. And what's important about it is that Hypnotic Pattern is a charm effect. Yeah. So if your bard is lucky to get their hands on an instrument of the bards, everyone that has to make a saving throw against your castings of Hypnotic Pattern has disadvantage on their saving throws. That can mess up a group of bad guys pretty it, quickly. It will end encounters, and it's only a third level spell. I think that Hypnotic Pattern is one of those spells that as a bard, you're going to grab that and keep it for your entire career. The bard also has a couple of great support magic here, spells here. Yeah. Um, they've got a full package, uh, but this is going to include things like Dispel Magic, and I think as well, Fairy Fire is another low level spell. Only bards and druids get it. But as your first level spell, just being able to generate advantage for your party members and pinpoint the invisible enemies. Yeah, fairy fire has so many practical uses in combat. It's it's such a powerful spell for such a low level. Yeah. Probably one of the biggest categories that the bard is gonna excel at is their utility spells. Encapsulated in this, are all the bards fantastic illusion-based spells. Yeah. Um, you've got Silent Image. You have Invisibility and Greater Invisibility. You have Major Image. And, of course, Polymorph. Everybody loves Polymorph. They also get Dimension Door as well. You're so jammed up at third level. There's so many good spells, because you, you've got like the spell magic, 
You want to get major image. You want to get hypnotic pattern. It really fills up pretty quick. And it makes it really hard because magical secrets is going to be a factor there too. Yeah. But these are all great spells. And like, if you have a DM that embraces the creativity of illusions, your bard will change the world with major image. Yeah. What about uh, in social situations, there's a lot of utility spells that really excel there as well. Yeah, because we have uh, charm person, disguise self, another illusion that so creative in its applications. Um, we've got suggestion, which again, just adds your, your words that extra level of power. Um, and finally, things like dominate person. So they also get a ton of healing spells as well. The bard can be the healer in the party. Mm -hmm. uh, they get healing word. Um, they get pretty much every healing spell, even the ability to raise dead. Yeah, the thing is, is that you've got such a limited spell selection. So what are you going to add into your arsenal? Yeah, you got to be a little choosy mm -hmm. here. Um, but having that vast array means that if, if it comes down to the fact that the bard is being relied on to heal the party... Uh, they can. I think Healing Word would be my definite pickup. Yeah. Just, it's a lifesaver of a spell. Um, and it just fits in with everything else. I don't know if I'd necessarily take Cure Wounds or double down on healing as a bard. But you're never not, you're never going to regret having Healing Word. So with the bard's magical secrets, you get to choose spells from any spell list in the game. So why don't we talk about some of our favorite choices that we would pick for our bard's magical secrets. I think every bard we've played with has taken fireball. I I mean, like, I'm biased in this. If you guys know me, um, I would take fireball no matter what with any character. Um, but for me, it's just an awesome damage dealing spell for uh, crowd control uh, area of effect. And um, the bard's other damage dealing spells don't really have the same impact as fireball. So to take that just kind of gives you that in your arsenal. Mm. It's difficult because because ever since Synaptic Static, which deals about the same damage, a little bit less, it's hard because like you got your magical secrets, particularly if you're the College of Lore bard, are really at a premium. There's so many great options to choose from that third level slot, like Counterspell. That that's another one that I would say is is almost a given. Counterspell is just so handy, and it, it's not in the bard's regular list. No, and in fact, Counterspell gets to add your jack of all trades bonus to the counter spell check so that makes it pretty powerful with a bard yeah it does if we're going around lots of different class lists are things like wall of force again a really potent battlefield control spell but you could even go lower levels like you could pick up something like spiritual weapon aid or bless from the cleric spell list the other ones that are really really tempting to go to are the warlock paladin and ranger spell lists when you said warlock i, I immediately thought of hex or eldritch blast because you can take a cantrip with a magical secret having eldritch blast would be really yeah cool. yeah uh from the paladin spell list you could take something like um destructive wave or paladin smite or how about fine steed and find greater steed just get a horse yep look at what you're getting already from your bard spells think about some of the other suggestions we made earlier and either double down on the things that you love doing or fill in the gaps of abilities that you're looking for. You really want to find the spells that are going to complement your bard's existing abilities, shore up those weaknesses, and really take your strengths to the next level. So let's talk about role-playing our bard. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of inspiration that we've talked about. There's a lot of cool ways mm -hmm. to really um, kind of bring your bard to life, and also they're one of the most fun classes to roleplay. Uh, but what are some of the things we should look at when trying to roleplay our bard? Well, I think the, the coolest thing is looking at going to the real world and looking at the traditions of actors, musicians, and other performers all throughout human history. Because magical things happen at different points of history, and the bards, like performers, have always been this category of people that have... Um, moved from the high classes to the low classes in society, right? And that's why artists are dangerous people, because they associate with the very, very rich and the very, very poor. I, I think one of the coolest things about bards that I, I started to try to think of this the other day, um, expanding my concept of bard away from just musicians and actors, mm -hmm. but like you have, you, you could really name any sort of uh, theatrical or performance art and turn that into a bard. 
You could be a dancer. You could be a slam poet. You could be whatever you want to be. A you could even be a painter. Yeah. Right? I could totally see a bard that, like, maybe their words aren't t- totally their focus. They have these words of wisdom and inspiration. But instead of composing songs and writing poems and lyrics and stories, maybe your bard is going around the world and painting something. Um, and one of the things that we talked about earlier in this episode, too, is, like, finding the lyrics to songs or insults or cool bits of poetry. Even if you're not very skilled at writing those things yourself. There's so many resources out there that you can read. And I think that as a bard, going just that little bit of extra distance is going to add so much flair to the role playing of your character, yeah. particularly if you develop your own unique style. I love the idea of a bard being like a rapper or a beat poet. Yeah. I've heard about, you know, horror stories of, of people playing bards where every time they wanted to cast a spell, the, the DM was like, well, can you sing a little song about it? And that should be something that comes naturally rather than something that's that's forced. So if you do feel really uncomfortable with the larger than life elements of playing the bard, that's okay. There's all sorts of interesting ways that your character might be a little bit more introspective and quieter. There have been many artists that have been reclusive people. Even though they've gone in great adventures and they've associated with the rich and famous and the low and poor and the lower depths of the world, they themselves were very quiet and introspective because they were thinking about all of the ways that they were going to express it through their art instead. Yeah. Uh, if you are a musician and you do play an instrument, that's a great inroad to playing a bard and using that understanding. Um, and like then using borrowing musical terms of saying like the crescendo of battle, right? Or the denouement. Or um, you know, even just saying that like your spells are a face melting guitar solo. What is your attachment to your instrument? What is mm-hmm. the relationship between you and your musical instrument of choice? Yeah. And then what is your bard's big ambition? Like, do you want to produce a great work of art? I think that for many artists and many writers, they talk about how you need to live life. And so your bard, in many ways, could be on that journey of discovery, right? And they just want to see amazing things and write this amazing story or song one thing that I love doing for a DM is that if your bard player embraces that, make them famous. People following along, other characters singing their songs. It's a great way as a DM to really make the bard player feel like they've had an influence in something special in the world and that they've crafted that epic legacy that lives on through song. So this has been our guide to the Bard class in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. We hope that you feel inspired to rock your next campaign. Now, of course, bards have magical secrets, which is such a diverse ability with so many options. If you have ideas for what spells bards might take with this ability, let us know in the comments below. And with all the spell casting you're going to be doing as a bard, you may want to check out our video on spells and spell casting right up over here. And if you want to march to a different tune, check out our other class guides right over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.